once again to Epicenter. This is an in-depth series where we interview tech leaders from across the region, which is the APAC region, and uh, who are helping to shape today's digital economy. Um, if you want to see past episodes, you can go to www.number1epicenter.co. Man, I don't even know how to start with today's guest. Um, this globe-trotting legend sitting across from me, this entrepreneur, this guy who is probably the first tech person in Asia that I ever met. Mr. Rich Robinson, welcome on Epicenter. Ronan Mentz, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you in YouTube and video land, look at this swagtastic The Epicenter mug with Ronan Mentz. It, Ding, I feel like I'm on Letterman or something. I don't know it's how like they pulled this off. The Joe Rogan experience, the Ronan Mentz experience, right? Well, we still got some time before Spotify calls to put us on, but... Um, <laughs> Rich, uh, dude, you, like we've known each other for... A quarter of a century, right? quarter of a century. Mm. So we just gave away our age. Right. I'm, I'm 30, <laughs> you're 32. Um, but I think today's topic is, is for sure something that you're... Like, I want to tell this whole world out there that there is not one person who knows more about the journey from Web 1 or Web 0 to Web 3 and how we're going to unlock the metaverse. Mm. But let's, let's kind of, we got to, people got to know who you are, right? No one knows you, or maybe everyone knows you. Like I said, the camera's uh -huh. always rolling. So let, let's do a quick throwback because you are the first Lao Wai, Guaylo, whatever that I ever knew who was in the Chinese ecosystem. Now, take us back to the 2000s. Mm. What was going on in China and tech? Tell us about that first. Yeah, so we met in the late 90s in Hong Kong, and uh, I went to China in 96 to be an internet guy after visiting in 93 and then getting my MBA in 94 and kind of discovering the internet on my own and thinking, wow, I want to put the internet with China, put chocolate and peanut butter, peanut butter and chocolate, and I want to go to China. I went to China in 96, and someone forgot to tell the internet to show up in the mainland, right? There was no, <laughs> there was nothing going on. There was no ISPs. Right. So I was like, I'm going to Honkers, uh, 5 million people at the time, a million people online, more people online in Hong Kong than all of the mainland, right? Yep. So, okay, I, 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 I belly up to the table in, uh, in, in Hong Kong, and I start, I start digging in, but the I um, on the prize was I want to get to the mainland. I want to like tap into what will eventually be the biggest internet population in the world, right? And you know you didn't need to be any kind of crazy visionary. You could smell that 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 was that was going to happen. So I go into Hong Kong in in, uh, in the early '90s or late '90s during the dot com boom, and I uh, worked with a company that did the first website on the internet, the first banner ad on the internet, and I started I started networking and meeting. What was that people. company again? It was called Motive Media, and I was um, head of uh, strategy and you know media planning for for the region. And it was it was a great way to cut my teeth. Mothership in New York City. Um, they incubated DoubleClick. Wow. You know, they were, DoubleClick was like sitting in the hallways of the mothership when I visited in New York. And then, you know, DoubleClick became this monster and probably the, one of the best acquisitions in the history of the world, right? Oh, Google. Um, yeah. And uh, I also, you know, my boss was the guy who did the first banner ad on the web, you know, 468 by 60. I was like, why is it 468 by 60? Why wasn't it like 450 by 50 or 500 <laughs> by 50? People were like, oh, I made your, I made your uh, uh, banner ad. It's 460 by 68. It's like, no, it's 460 by... Anyway, he's like, because we did an ad for at and on hotwire.com in 1995, and that was the space that they had in their website. Oh, so then wow. like that became the standard forever, right? I mean, like... Wow. Like the crazy thing about standards, I just saw this XKCD comic. It's like, there's, there's 14 disparate standards, and they're all bullshit. We're going to make one master standard for everything. So then... They make this one master standard, and instead of there being 14 standards, now there's 15 standards, right? So it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it's, like it's kind of crazy, uh, and that's kind of something that's happening in Web3, but we'll get to that. So anyway, I, I knew that China was the the place that I wanted to be, and I met these two guys who were the founders of RenRen.com back, uh, back in Hong Kong. Wow. I, I started this internet networking group called I&I, and I, and I just kind of pulled together like – my love of, you know, that you share of like just my, my spirit animal is a golden retriever. I just want to mix with people and uh, I'm an extroverted extrovert. So I started pulling people together and 
we um, we had Jack Ma come and speak when they were you know the company was like fifty people and he you know he crushed it and after that we started bringing more and more people together and I met these two founders of Renren Ren, and then we were a unicorn before unicorns were dubbed were unicorns even named and we did a backdoor listing in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and we um, you know raised thirty one million bucks and Rupert Murdoch from uh, News Corp personally did the due diligence in the company, and it was just it was this heady, crazy time, right? And we grew to four hundred people, and we opened up the offices in New York, uh, Silicon Valley, Beijing, Shanghai, Singapore, um, and then within nine months, and then nine months later, we closed the offices in New York, Silicon Valley, <laughs> Beijing, Shanghai, Singapore. But I moved up to Beijing with the company, when and was that? Um, that was that was ninety nine two thousand. I was I was kind of splitting the difference. Right. I had a, a foot in each boat, and then I went all in to uh, to Beijing. And then you uh, graciously um, introduced us to our uh, mutual friend Desmond O'Neill, the first guy that I met in Beijing. Shout out to Desmondo, uh, and uh, it was um, it was pretty different. Like going to to Beijing in two thousand, it was just. You know, very much like you blew your nose and like black hole came oh, out of it. And bicycles like, everywhere, right? Bicycles. It was a bicycle city still, yeah. right? And it's now become a bicycle city because of all the shared bicycles, but also ridiculously the worst traffic in the world, you know, objectively so. Um, but it was also a magical time and that like anything could happen, right? So it's like I, you know, and there was very few people online and very few entrepreneurs relative, right? There was Sina Sohu Netties and, and a few other companies that had gone public, but it was still very much kind of a nascent entrepreneurial scene. And, and in that time, you could actually mingle with a lot of these early tech entrepreneurs. Sure. Right? Like yeah, Jack Char Ma. Charles John from Sohu or yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, I knew them when they were just millionaires. Yeah. Before they all, you know, the most billionaires in the world are now in Beijing, 100, 100 plus billionaires, right? Wow. And mostly because of tech uh, entrepreneurship, yeah. That is so awesome. And the most valuable startup in the world, Beijing, TikTok, right? Right. And Beijing has become the one place that can rival Silicon Valley. But, you know, that was... That's that's twenty plus years later, right? And there's a, a lot in between there. And and the, the this, I want to talk a little bit about this Chinese blueprint, right? Because mm. China, from early days, like your days of Ren Ren, Ten Cent, mm. even till now, the number one, the m high, most highly valued tech startup in the world is ByteDance. Mm. And this is twenty plus years of of being at the top of its game. Mm -hmm. right? Of course, there's been some ups and downs, right? Certainly, yeah. But what, what would you say is 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 the China tech blueprint um, going forward? Like, how does China continue to to succeed in the way it's been so successful over the past twenty years? Yeah. So you know, as I said, there was almost nobody online, and now there's you know billion plus people online there, right? So there's like a gigantic um, captive native audience there, right? And it's mobile first, and it's incredibly um, advanced in a way that people in the West don't really grasp, right? Right. Because it's so uh, internally focused that unless you um, are in China and have, you know, the ability to use these apps, you don't you don't taste it, right? And TikTok is really the first, um, you know, manifestation of that outside of the country in a big way. So there is this. Uh, one thing that people love to do is say, oh, you know what, China is a copycat and China can't really uh, innovate. And, and that was certainly true in the beginning in that there was a lot of copycatting. And I think China, you know, had to kind of learn how to innovate. But man, you know, I teach a class at Peking University at the Guanghua MBA. And one of the things I talk about is GDP since Jesus. Wow. So you look at like zero to now, the first 1800 years, China dominated, right? And it was mostly a function of population. But, you know, a lot of people don't really understand. It's like Industrial Revolution, you know, China got left behind. But then China's really, really caught up in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. But, yes, population really informed the GDP growth. But there was tons of innovation. And there were amazing systems in place. And there were amazing inventions. And there's amazing sort of industriousness right. of Chinese people, right? Now, there's like this yeah. hot noise, like any Chinatown, any Chinese population around buzz. the world. Chinese city, yeah, buzz, right? Humming. And, and, and it's really there, right? Yeah. There, and, and that's what I tasted when I first went to China in 93. And that's really translated itself into entrepreneurship. And, and, and that's like manifested itself into the speed of things 
you know, I have a podcast that I'm, I'm launching. It's called At the Speed of China. And the, it's actually launching um, uh, later this month. And the, the thesis is four years outside of China is a year inside of China. Mm-hmm. And it's partially this Jojo Leo, this 9 a.m., 9 p.m., six days a week work culture. That's one part of it. And, you know, that's, there, there's some um, kind of pushback around that. But there are so many other uh, factors as well, too, in how things are done in China in a, you know, you know basically Elon Musk says at the end of the day, the pace of innovation is all that matters. It's not just about innovation, it's that pace. It's those cycles of experimentation until you get through to the other side. It's like, ah, uh, my thesis has now been proven, you know, you know, correct, you know, or I've adjusted it so now that it's correct. And like whoever can like do those, those OODA loops, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, absorb, orient, decide, act, and like, you know, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Oh, now, now we got to, now we have a fit and like keep going. Like that's who's going to win. And China is so far, you know, advanced in that, in that way is that like, it's really not about some sort of like Steve Jobs genius. It's really about, you know, just the, the hard yards of just grinding and Grit experimenting. And the resilience yes. there of, of the Chinese community. Indeed. I mean, so if I reflect a little bit on, on the evolution of the app economy, mm. right? I mean, no one was leading in 2008. Mm. Right? App stores, okay, this, here's a, a few apps in, 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 in the App Store and then Google Play. But everyone kind of started at the same place. But China kind of had a running start mm. because everyone's access to the internet was through their mobile phone. Yes. Right? So you had, number one, funding coming into China in early like 2010, 2011, 2012, right? Mm. A lot of venture capital a lot of availability of, of state funds, right? Mm. Number two, engineers. Mm. You had almost 7 million engineers graduating. Grinding out every year. Every more. Yes, year, yes. grinding into the system. Mm-hmm. Right? And you had a mobile-first economy, right, where people were just, like, they understood mobile mm. experience. And, and even beginning. more, if I may, like, yeah. there is this, like, it's a 5,000-euro culture, right, with tons of tradition. Like, if you want to think about China... You don't think about like, you know, the Xi Jinping or the Mao Zedong, like, you know, 70 plus years of communism that's, you know, a very tiny fraction. Mm -hmm. You think about like dynastic China, like the old, like you have to understand China, you really have to understand so many dynastic layers there, right? So it's, it's a very like cultured, contextual, deep country, while at the very same time, insanely practical and pragmatic and will change on a dime. And it's the biggest market in the world too, right? So think about this. Chinese people, hey, we invented paper money, right? And we are the biggest country in the world by population. And we have like the oldest kind of culture. Paper money, Shenzhen, Zaijian. Like they got rid of paper money five years ago, six years ago. It's literally disappeared. I like, remember going to Beijing with a hundred kuai and they're like, huh? Yeah. Zangda, <laughs> I give you change. Dirty money. I didn't want to touch it. Like, and like, I mean, oh, it was crisp. It was crisp because yeah, yeah. it's out of the. Oh, no, no, but be, oh, okay, okay, out of the. Yeah. Yes, yes. But some people are like I don't even want to touch it. Like money, yeah, right? Like money. And, and be, I, I, I tell people coming to the China sometimes like there's three types of people that that, that don't use you know uh, Wei Xin Zhifu like WeChat Pay or, or Alibaba Pay. It's like very very old people, very very young people. And you, tourists, right? It's actually a, yeah. like a problem. It's like, oh, we don't take credit cards. You don't have like, and like digital money like became so widespread and so rapidly adopted that it would like, it literally disappeared overnight. And, 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 and name cards, that yeah. sort of like dance of like two hands on the name card, like that was such an ingrained part of like culture. Asian culture, but specifically like Northern Asian culture disappeared. Sawi Sal. So you yeah. just like scan uh, uh, the barcode and like now that's become part post COVID. I was just at Korea blockchain week and at this plate earn thing, everybody's like, okay, scan my telegram, my scan WhatsApp. Scan my WhatsApp. Yeah, we take a selfie, we yeah. send each other a thing, right? That's the new dance. And like that dance in China has been going already a half decade. Yes. So China's really pioneering, but that China blueprint that you said, yes. like that's informing the rest of Asia in a way that they're not looking to Silicon Valley. They're looking to, to, to China. This is such an awesome segue because we're talking about the China blueprint. We're talking about one of the leaders in technology. Um, obviously, economic powerhouse. Let's kind of move into this, this evolution that we're seeing right now. Mm. Web 1, Web 2, and where you're spending a lot of time right now in Web 3. 
So, I mean, how do you, how does an entrepreneur out there or how does a company who's been relevant in web one, relevant in web two, and now looking at web three is like, what do we do next? What, what is that blueprint? How does a company, how does an entrepreneur go and unlock this metaverse? Great. Excellent. Yeah. So let me frame that for you. So a lot of people talk about web one is read the internet, right? You right. can just like, it's a static, you know, one way website. It's a brochure kind of. So web one is read. Web two, read, write. So I can write now, but, you know, not just post something on Twitter or Facebook. You know, it's basically 1990 to 05 was Web 1. 05 to 2020 is Web 2. I can also write a video or a podcast or, you know, audio, video, text, One whatever, right? So I'm, I'm interacting with the, with the Web. Um, web 3, read, write, own. So now I can actually have broad owner, digital asset ownership across across the internet like that's the problem because thing uh, that's a problem that's being solved because right now we are all in kind of these fiefdoms mm -hmm. where we're serfs s-e-r-f's yes serfs, not surfing waves. on the internet right yeah. yes and we are you know lord uh, lords of google and you know the the kingdom of Zuckerberg Sitting or whatever, right? On top of activism, the shoulders activism of religion, the giants, right? right? So when I when we first met in the late '90s, it was like uh, you look at all the top companies in the world; they were all energy and commodities companies, right? Right. Now it's all the data, right? Yes. And uh, it's the the they used to call them the fangs, but you know, let's just call it like Facebook Meta, you know, Google Alphabet, uh, you know, Apple and uh, Netflix and you know, Tencent and you know. Activism Blizzard and, you know, all, all of these companies now, they all take the time and treasure and data of their users and they funnel it straight up to their shareholders. And um, it's something that I think in, in a way it's very Matrix-esque, right? It's right. like you're in bondage and you don't know you're in bondage. Take the blue pill to go back to Web 2. Take the red pill to go to Web 3. So I took the red pill early nice. last year. Um, company called Animoca Brands based in Hong Kong, you know, we've known Yat for a long time. One of the nicest, what a rock best star. people in the yeah. planet, not just in, in this space, but just as, a, you know, and he's like, he would always organize these events during Rise and we'd go hiking and on his, yeah. on his, on his boat, called it Yacht's Yacht. Yeah, and, Yacht's um, Yacht. So, 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 so Yacht asked me to be an advisor early last year and, um, you know, Animoca started as a game company and uh, then uh, listed uh, in the Australian Stock Exchange, got delisted because of you know not anything untowards or illegal, it's just that right. they were doing stuff with ERC twenty tokens yep. um, and the Australian Stock Exchange. We securitize you, and then you securitize all this other stuff. So you know we're still public, but we're not listed. Right. And um, the company made a big shift from just free to play games, you know, in app purchases in oh eight in twenty eighteen to like we're going on chain. And you know, I wish I could say that I smelt it and I, mm -hmm. I understood it immediately. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I remember chatting the ad and I was like, blockchain and games, like blockchain is for like crypto and for like uh, supply chain manager, like, like explain to me. And then he, you know, he's like, you can own your digital assets, right? Mm -hmm. When you buy an in-app purchase, you know, it's usually like that kind of like digital asset kind of has three categories. One is utility. I have a sword. Yes. I have a tractor. I have a horse. Race car. Right? Yeah, race car, right? Or I have some sort of, um, you know, identity uh, or status, right? This is my avatar and, you know, these are my sort of badges or whatever. And then there's some sort of like self-expression. Like I'm going to like, you know, give you a high five or I'm going to send you roses to flirt with you or I'm going to, you know, do, oh, do whatever. Right? Yeah. So, mm, <laughs> oh, behave. <laughs> and uh, those, those kind of like three categories, you know, wrapped into one, people were buying that stuff, the Shuni Wupin in China, yes. like in, in a big way. Like Tencent, for instance, um, Tencent gets 85% of their revs from in-app purchases, digital items, and 15% yes. from ads. Facebook, it's something like 15% from games and digital items, 85% from ads, right? Right. Who's more aligned with their user? Like who has... Who, you know, the, the, it's the user wants to purchase these items. It's not like, you know, something where the user is the product. It's like the, the product. One that's not schwitzing over the current uh, state of the uh, of privacy. In, indeed, right? indeed, right? So it's like there, there really is, you know, to be able to put that on chain and even right. just, you know, very simply just switch from in-app purchases that you now own, right? My son's 18 and 16, 
you know, you talked about your your boys, 14 and 12, like time and treasure into games. Like they almost don't like it's so different. The you know, the the the, the added the time that I gave into sports or into, you know, doing you know, other stuff in, in the real world, like right. uh, how I dress or whatever, like they care about their virtual presence and they care about their comp competitive landscape and they care about their social aspect all virtually. And yet they don't own anything. They put so much time. little money and time and their data and their just effort in there mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it's actually kind of ridiculous, right? In right. a way that you, you like uh, in the future, I believe five, seven years from now you're like oh you're 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 doing something and you don't actually own own it like that's silly like why would you why would you do that right i mean there's some use cases to be able to like rent or lease something but to actually like when, when you could actually own it then, then then yes you should you should own it right so the mission and vision of animoca is this open metaverse with broad digital asset ownership for users across it right and so it, if you so first of all, you articulated this really well. From read to write and read to now write, read, and own. Mm. Now, I'm an entrepreneur, right? Or not really. I'm a entrepreneur. Mm, but, um, you're an assassin, dude. You built this app flyer into hundreds of people. You're dude, badass operator you are. This is about you. No. You're an entrepreneur. Inter entrepreneur. Yes. Interesting. Intra, wantra, whatever. Um, how does... Let's say a gaming company out there who is very active in 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 Web two gaming or mm. app gaming. How do they how do how do they leverage Web three? What are like? Do you have two or three recommendations or piece of advice that you can give to them? Mm. So if you look at um, how this ownership is enabled, there's different chains. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, a lot of NFTs are built on uh, Ethereum, right? right? Because that's um, that's they cool. have they have you know uh, uh, special um, you know kind of you know uh, protocols so, so spe special ways of doing that. Let's just yeah. put, it, put it that simply. But then there's also you know there's there's Avalanche and there's Polygon and there's Binance Smart Chain and there's right. Solana and now Aptos is in the game. So many, right? Yes, there's so many, right? So like that's that's so you, so you have like so the, the the existing yes. infrastructure of the internet and now put these tectonic plates on top of there right like there's one chain called wax that we invested in early on has a ton of wallet users but like devs aren't using it as much so that's kind of like shifting out right then aptos is like all these guys from facebook that like spun off and like created a new l1 chain that's launching soon like that tectonic plate is sliding in right but then there's also like um, layer one chains where people are like trying to like you know, replace, uh, you know, like a, like a, like a Solana, like a completely, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a different way of, of doing things than say Ethereum. But then there's the L2 change, the layer two change that like piggyback off of, um, uh, off of Ethereum. Right. And, and then like it, it, and then the side chains and everything else in between. Right. So it's like, so it's open, like, it's like, it? that's, that's just the foundation layer in it. And like, I was in Korea blockchain week this week, as I said, and I'm just like meeting the founders of near protocol and talking to the team from Solana and Polygon and Aptos. And I'm just like, wow, it's like, it's constantly shifting those tectonic plates. Right. And that's the foundation upon which this is built. So it's like, there, there there's still, you know, you have to kind of like choose your chain. Mm -hmm. And I think in the future, a chain's going to become like a cloud provider. But like potentially, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, hey, what, what, you know, like, oh, I love that website. Oh, really? Which um, which cloud provider do they use? I, I don't know. Azure, uh, Google, uh, Amazon. I'm not. I, I don't know. Swaby, yeah, right? And it's like, and I think that's gonna as an end user, like as a developer, you're like, you care, right? right. You know, a like corporate maybe a little more Azure, right? And you know, startup maybe you know Amazon or Google is like, but like as an end user, like you shouldn't you shouldn't really have to worry about that, right? It should be seamless, right? It should, should be. All about the end user experience. Indeed, that's that, that's, that's like that that bar none. It has to start there. Absolutely, well said. And like I I look back at like, you know, that was one of the reasons why I was brought on as an advisor because I've been through this, you know, yes. uh, Web one, Web two, smartphone, China, right? Where it's like we clearly remember like Google or like any of this like eBay or Amazon. Like that's bullshit. Like, right? And like, oh, no, it's like Facebook, they have no business model. They bought Instagram for a 
$1.2 billion? That's bullshit. Jesus, right? What are they thinking? And like the iPhone, what a bullshit toy that is. I like my BlackBerry with a keyboard. The iPhone is like useless, right? That's yeah, bullshit. That right? Feel? So and it's like, you know, and like apps, apps are like toys. That's bullshit, right? And nobody, nobody thinks about that. And like now, but with Web3, it's it's similar, right? There's always like this resistance uh, against there, that. There right? are tons of naysayers out there, right? Of course, of course. What right? do you say to them? Well, you know, I believe that this is not once in a decade or once in a lifetime. I believe mm -hmm. it's like once in a century. Wow. Because this is something significantly different from before because when things are on chain and the permissionless and the decentralized and the um, distributed nature of this, this is going to change things in a way that we, we, we don't know what's coming. But, and it's going to be chaotic and there's going to be up and down cycles and there's gonna be downsides of it, but it's going to have a seismic societal shift. Like I believe that, you know, writ large, web three on chain digital assets and just industries are going to get more gamified, get more tokenized, have a lot more power to, to the user. And it's just, and it just kind of, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Like one thing that we invested in is called fan controlled football. Mm -hmm. It's a new sports league. Mm -hmm. And the, um, it's a, it's kind of like rugby sevens, but for American football. And it's all played inside one stadium in Atlanta. And, you know, of course it has, uh, you know, new bells and whistles on Twitch and, you know, the, the, the camera angles and player cameras, but there's only athletic coaches. There's no uh, coaches making the call. You use an app. Uh, and you, you know, upvote. Okay, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna run this play, or we're gonna, we're gonna pass. A, we're gonna do a button hook call, you know, and and then and like that's, you know, that's uh, controlled by the fans. But in the future, shouldn't sports teams, shouldn't even leagues be like owned and controlled by the fans? Like there are examples of that out there. Mm -hmm. Like should it be just like billionaires that are like you know, owning that. Like people we're not talking about OnlyFans. <laughs> no, <laughs> indeed. So um. Only fans, uh, uh, Franchise Ronan. I, I want to ask Ronan Mentz, yeah, okay. but the S is a S is a, a, a dollar cute. sign. It's a Q. Yeah, I want to I, I want to ask you a question, because in Web two we see that there's few big tech that own it. Mm. Will that happen in Web three? Well, I mean, uh, I hope not, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the who can who can necessarily say, right? I mean, that's why we're really advocating for the open mm -hmm. uh, open metaverse at, at Anamoka Brands, because right. you know if you look at like. Vitalik Buterin, he's the founder of Ethereum. Yes. What, what was his origin story? He was bitten by a uh, radioactive um, uh, digital item in that he was playing World of Warcraft as a kid and they nerfed him. And what nerf means is you have some sort of like powerful weapon uh -huh. and it gets sort of like morphed into like a, a, a powerless nerf gun. Wow. Pew, 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 pew. And he was like, he cried himself to sleep at 12 years old. And he's like, this is bullshit. Like, because cause games do that all the time because they, they need to be able to like, yeah, I just got, I, I, I got fucked. Right. And like, I don't want to, uh, have to experience that again. So I'm going to create a layer one blockchain so that I can enable people to have independence and, you know, permissionless ownership of their own digital assets. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's actually like, he publicly talks about that a lot, right? And so we're, of course, of course, Zuck and crew and everybody else who has any kind of like major, you know, Web2 company, like their entire existence is like, let's survive and thrive, right? So they're going to want to like, um, you know, continue that. And or can contain this. Yeah, and like, but, you know, like history tells us that like, if you look at like Nokia, Nokia was the number one brand across all of Asia Pacific, right? It was like, okay, globally, it was like, and then, and then like, th there's even a video you can like, it's like the, the CEO of like Nokia, like sobbing, like we did everything right. And like, and you know, they just like disappeared, right? And like, so, you know, when you look at like, you know, I mean, Microsoft's come back strong, but like there, there's like, there's, there's waves of like them being like left behind because things are changing. Right. And, right. and of course, Zuck smells it and he's like, let's change the name to meta or, you know, other companies are in the game space or are, 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 are embracing this. And it, it, it will be, you know, like this is how the way I think of it. Like we spend a lot of time in China and I think China, Korea, Japan, it's kind of like 
planet China, planet Korea, planet Japan. Like I went to you know Korea and like you can use your bird app mm -hmm. uh, globally to get uh, a bird scooter there, right? But everything else is like in Korean, like the Korean Uber and the Korean, you know, or the Korean, the, the, the oh. equivalent. Yes. Or, or like, you know, I want to book a restaurant or I want to, you know, do whatever payment. It's like all closed, right? Yes. For Koreans, right? And, and it's terrific and it works well. Japan, pretty similar. China, Absolutely. very similar, right? Absolutely. But then around the rest of the world, like you can kind of use like Uber across, you know, yeah, more, more or less, right? And, and, and it, it's not always the case, but it's like, but so I think the metaverse will be like that. There'll be pockets of like, this is a closed walled garden. But then the idea is that hopefully there are like these global, you know, open, uh, open protocols that are, interoper that are interoperable and that, that, that work to be able to give power back to the user, right? And, yeah. um, you know, that's kind of the, the, the broad vision. But if you're talking about like blocking and tackling like what's actually, you know, interesting for a, a game company right now, I think in general like NFTs, like – you know, we see NFTs like uh, a board ape or CryptoPunks or, um, you know, maybe NBA Top Shot, right? right? Which is like they did, you know, videos of uh, uh, 10 second NBA uh, highlights, right? And some of those are like collectibles. Some of those are sort of like just self expression. And it's an experiment, right? eBay started selling only Pez. Amazon started selling only books, mm -hmm. but you know Jeff Bezos knew from the beginning I'm going to sell everything, right? It's right. like a arrow to Z, right? A to Z, yes. right? Amazon's exactly. the biggest river in the widest river, so it's like that's that was his vision. He starts with books, right? eBay, Pierre Omidar, like I'm gonna, I my girlfriend has a Pez collection. I'm going to put that up there, but it's going to be broadly all collectibles. But then you know we're going to have a, a, an open uh, mm -hmm. you know auction for people, right? And I think some of these early NFTs, it's easy to be like NFTs are just bullshit. It's, Freaking monkey JPEG, what? Right, it just doesn't make any sense, right? But NFTs are kind of the, um, you know, it, 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 you go on to like the the, the 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 first principles or like like the, um, it's, it's like a prime unit of like mm -hmm. what how people will interact with Web three. First iteration yeah. of first ownership. iteration, indeed. Yeah. And, and there'll be there'll be utility baked into NFTs, and now in a much deeper way and they'll be really connected with the user. They call them like soul bound where it's like something that, you know, really, you know, connected to the identity of the user. And there's going to be, you know, this provenance so you can see the, 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 the origin of it and, you know, all the history attached to it. So there's like things called PO app proof of proof of attendance. Like I, I bought it, I bought an NFT ticket to a concert and like, this is not like a ticket that I bought on eBay, like that was me at that concert, mm -hmm. right? And like, I have like street cred that I've been to all of these, all of these concerts. And, you know, in, 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 in the future, NFTs are going to have, you know, um, a lot of uh, utility that we don't see right now. Why games? So we go to games because gamers, biggest community in the world, 3.2 billion gamers, right? Uh, globally. Right. And gaming is a big industry. Music, 25 billion a year. All entertainment, in home, theater, 100 billion a year, mm -hmm. buck 25. Gaming, a buck 80. So it's, gaming is 50% bigger than inter, all entertainment, music and, right. and theater and, and, and uh, um, movies and TV combined, right? 180 billion a year for gaming, 3.2 billion gamers. And by the way, they're like extremely comfortable with virtual items and they're very digitally savvy and they have you know, strong communities and they spend a lot of time online. And specifically here in Asia, we see that like half, more than half all the gamers are here mm -hmm. in Asia, crypto users in Asia. Yeah. So we're using gaming as the tip of the spear and to be able to like bring utility into NFTs that are in games. And like very simply, you have an in-app purchase, some IAP in a, in, a, in a game, and to just kind of like switch that, make that into an NFT, like that's kind of like a, you know, a simple, simple way forward. Now, now I own that, now I own that item. You remember the, uh, the 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 acronym for 3G, right? When it was released, girls, games, and gambling. Gambling. There so you go. Thank you. This is kind of, I think it's always the segue of of innovation, mm -hmm. right? These three categories, Indeed. how it how it kind of evolves the internet, mm -hmm. right? or the interweb, or mm. the blockchain, or whatever it is that we're talking. Yeah, about. Yeah, and if I may, just one thing, which one is more. really fascinating, yeah. to bring China in. It's like Web One was all U.S. more or less, right? right. Web two, you know, very strong European 
you know, player, especially in places like, you know, uh, Sweden, a lot of unicorns coming out of there. But really, like, it was really Web 2 was like U.S. and China right. really kind of dominated most of the, uh, uh, you know, unicorns and just overall um, uh, market share uh, and, you know, mind share globally. Web 3, mm-hmm. China's out. China's like, we tapped out. We're, gonna, we're doing our CBDC, our mm-hmm. central bank digital, digital currency. Mm-hmm. We're creating this, you know, ring fence, wall garden. Only inside China can, yeah. can you do crypto stuff. So whatever China's doing, it's going to be that planet China that's not going to be part of the open metaverse. Right. And that's going to hobble it, you know, in terms of like being able to, to do stuff globally necessarily, right? It means everyone else has to step up in, or has in, the indeed, chance. Indeed. And in the U.S., like... Despite itself, like things, because there's just so much, you know, um, entrepreneurship and tech entrepreneurship and talent there, like the regulatory system there is, you know, not necessarily like um, super, you know, uh, set up for for Web3, but but it's still it's still occurring and happening. Right. And we see in Asia, specifically Southeast Asia has become this this epicenter for Web3, you know. Sky. Did you say epicenter? Epicenter. The epicenter, dare I say. With Ronan Mintz. Ding! Ding, ding. Yeah, yeah.